today. We, we got that, okay. And we have quite a number of people here. Some of you are, when I say old, I mean, you're familiar with our classes here at Florida School, both my classes and others of the great teachers that are here. And I guess you might know that we're also having a Florida Herbal Conference. And that, by the way, is taking registrations for in-person. And I'll be there in person. Many other great teachers will be there in person. And then also you can attend virtually and have access to those presentations um, for, I think, a year. So that's something that you can look at also on the Florida School. So I think we really wanted to take your questions. I sent you two handouts. One's a real rundown of the class, which we'll go through. I'll share it on the screen and go through it. And also I sent you something about the doctrine of signatures, because of course, all of us here are really interested in herbalism. And there's so many concepts and precepts in herbalism. And I love all of them, but one that I'm very, very partial to is the doctrine of signatures, which tells us that a plant will have a clue for us in terms of what would be a really great way to use it. Sometimes about the color or the form, something like that. It's just really fun. It's a fun topic and we'll dive into it a little bit later. But I'm wondering what the best way to take the, oh, I see that. Maggie put up a link to the Florida Herbal Conference, and you definitely can grab that. You can also just Google Florida Herbal Conference after our class today or during it. And I want to take your questions, like, why are you here? So even though there's a lot of people, um, I think you can try kind of just unmuting and seeing how that works out and, and just say your question. So does anybody have a question that they would like answered? That's why you attended this session. Because that's why it's called Q&A. <laughs> okay, just shout it out. I see JC. Buck. Hi. Hi. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm here today because I have um, watched you in other presentations. And I just really value what you um, bring to the table for all of us. I love your approach. And um, my question is, I am not um, a nurse, an RN in any way. I am just studying um, herbalism. I have a deep interest in health overall. And I'm wondering, I, you know, is this a place for me? To Excellent question. In? Excellent question, because I think that name, Natural Nurse Herbal Certification Course, could actually throw people off or say, oh, it's only for nurses. So that's exactly a great question. I'm glad we planted that question with you. No, we didn't. But it's, it's very appropriate, and many people may be wondering that. The Natural Nurse Herbal Certification Course does have a couple of meanings. One is, that is my legal name, the Natural Nurse Registered Trademark R. So that's about that it's the class I put together and I teach it through the Florida School. Also, in terms of nurses, we love nurses to take it, not only nurses, anyone with a license, such as an RN, a nurse practitioner, a licensed massage therapist, an acupuncturist, an RD, which is a registered dietitian or a clinical nutritionist, anyone who needs CE units for their ongoing license. And by the way, we have found this works in every state. They get CE units, 18 CE units for taking this class. And they might find that's really exciting to take this class and get your CE units instead of taking like just a totally conventional, you know, reading uh, uh, something class, not so interesting how to change a bed in terms of nursing or whatever it is, or another class on drugs. So they can take this and get 18 CEUs. However, anyone can take it. All you do is you take the full entire class and you still get a beautiful certificate that you can hang on your wall that is granted by the Florida School of Holistic Living. You still get it. It still says 18 CEUs on it, but you don't have to send that to the state because you don't need them, but you still get the certificate and the knowledge. 
Also, it's $15 extra if you want those CEUs, so you don't pay that either. So there's no limit on who can take this. There's no prerequisite whatsoever. It's just a matter of wanting to learn about herbal medicine. And that's why in the email, I even said, how do I become an herbalist? Like, let's say you love herbs and you use them for yourself and your family. That's an herbalist right there. Herbalist right there. You know, if that's what you want to do with it, maybe the next step would be, I want to feel really competent to create a protocol for my family, you know, for my parents or for my kids or for myself or for, for my pets. You know, I want to know the correct steps because right now, unlike when I became an herbalist, which was 1964, when I became an herbalist, and at that point, there was not so many people to study with. I mean, it was much more limited. And I studied with such people as Dr. Bernard Jensen and Ann Wigmore and a lot of people who were teaching at that time of herbal medicine and some of the really older herbalists like Anthony Kwiku Ando um, from Ghana and many of the people steeped in herbal medicine from around the world. Those were my teachers. But it's not like now, I mean, I go online and see influencers who are, I don't know, maybe 20, saying that they're herbalists. One I saw just the other day that called St. John's wart, spelled it W-A-R-T, and talked about using it for warts. Now, that's a very, it's a person who doesn't know anything, nothing. And it's a shame that someone like that could just be spewing out information that could actually harm someone. So this is about knowing your good sources. I share a lot with different links, different places, how to create a protocol for yourself and your family. So you don't have to be a nurse, but if you are a nurse or someone with a license that requires credits, either way, it's good. So does that answer your question? Good. Thank you for asking it. Hi there. I have an, I, I raised my hand, but I guess we don't need to. My name is Jen. I have been a registered nurse for 24 years, um, and I'm currently enrolled at the Matthew Wood Institute of Herbalism in his first uh, year vitalist class. I absolutely love it. It's, it's a ridiculously robust program. My question to you, it's a big one. I am not currently excited with the delivery of health care in our mainstream system. I am looking to bring something different with my nursing skills in addition to herbalism to help people heal. Am I completely in a dream world that this can be not only legally within the confines of our scope of practice, I live in the state of Maine, um, where nurse consulting is that kind of gray area that you can work in. When I remembered not loving nursing diagnosis in nursing school, but realizing that that's what people need help with on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's completely within our practice to nursing diagnose. Can I do this as a registered nurse? So I'll, I'll answer your question directly. You. The okay. answer is yes. And I have a specific class, not this class, the Natural Nurse Herbal yep. Certification course, which is more all about herbalism, but I have a, yep. a one, you take it one time, this class that I have, it's on my website at okay. naturalnurse.com. I've also taught it through the Florida school here as well. So they have it on their archives as an archived class, but it's, but that one, we really go one-on-one -on -one, and it's called career paths in natural health. And when we do that, you actually send me two things. You send me your resume okay. or your CV yep. and a paragraph about what your perfect day at work would be. <laughs> and then we talk about, okay, how can you get there? the fastest way and a legal way. Yes. In yes. order to delve into the legal, I'll tell you this right up front, I can help you, but I really can give great information about two states. 
One is New York and one is Florida, because when it comes to the legal verbiage and how it has to be pronounced and all that, it's that is a state monitored thing. But I could work with you to look on your state to find out, like in Florida, nurse practitioners actually have a way that they are allowed to recommend herbs. It's specific in the language. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I don't know about your state. A lot of them, it's just who knows. Who knows? It's very vague. And of course, that's on purpose. But I've been... I worked with an herbalist for six months, which is how I ended up going down this path because I knew something was missing and I knew I wasn't done with my career yet. And and then, you know, found Matthew Wood and all that stuff. But there's something unique about being a nurse and knowing how to all, like I, I have a lot of the skills that beginning herbalists would have to learn. That's right. So it's, it's where do I fit? I, I don't, I'm not a beginner. But I am a beginner in herbal. You don't even, so it's that kind of thing. Well, you should be excited. Okay. And and the answer is a stark yes. Okay. And I got my first nursing degree in 1973. And I've only done holistic nursing, only my whole, my whole life. Okay. That's what I've done. So now it's really so, so much more exciting a field to be in. And I'll tell you this, I'm also on the NIH. That's the National Institute of Health. No, I know what that is. And they now say within our meetings that we have that what should be standard of practice is lifestyle medicine. Thank you. For for first intervention, first intervention, when anybody goes to any healthcare provider, they should get, they should get food. I mean, real food, not just eat healthy. Oh, right. For them. They should get exercise. They should get mental care and stress reduction they should drink water yeah okay (laughs) they should get herbs herbs is in there botanical interventions really yes homeopathic interventions then pharmaceuticals yeah like way down the road not that we throw them out but the the system place right it's horrible though when the first thing you get is a list of drugs to take most of which give you adverse effects worse than the condition you came in with. So that is a bad uh, setup there. Well, and also we were always taught to treat the symptoms. Herbalism, you need to find what caused them. Exactly. And all of naturopathic medicine is that way too. Okay. So So the answer is yes. take your other class. Okay. (laughs) Well, you don't need to, but if you do take this class that we're doing too, this one gives you 18 CEUs of credit towards your nursing degree, which is nice as well. So you want absolutely. Me to tell you that Maine doesn't have any requirements. Oh, that's good. Okay. But neither does New York, really. It's uh, now and then, but Florida is very strict every two years. It's, we should uh, have requirements, is my point. Right. Well, anyway, okay. Thank you so very nice much. Nice to meet you. Thank you for Thank your you. question. Thank you. So that's what we're going to do, guys. Let's see. Do we know an herbal school in the U.S. that focuses on Caribbean herbs? I see a question up here. Well, I will tell you that several, um, we do talk about them here in our class, but we don't focus on only, only Caribbean herbs. But in my book, The Natural Medicine Chest, I have an entire section called Herbs from the Shaman's Garden. And that is the knowledge that was shared with me Um, by a man named Jamba of the Maroons. And Jamba is a Maroon healer on the north coast of Jamaica. When I say is, he's no longer with us physically, but I studied with him many, many years. And he wrote, helped co-write a lot of the the knowledge in there. So I don't know a, a whole school that just does Caribbean herbs, but I do know a lot of teachers there, like Diane Robinson from Jamaica also, who wrote several books and does teach now a little bit, I believe too. And if she teaches a class, she would be focused on it. We co-taught at um, in Jamaica also at the University of West Indies. So if I thought about that a little bit more, you can email me after the class and I'll send you some of those contacts. But I don't know of an herbal school in particular that focuses only on Caribbean herbs. Although we do quite a bit here because, you know, Florida, right? We teach a class on edible and medicinal plants of Florida. There are a lot of the same plants, Cerisee, et cetera. Thanks for that question.
So I got a question about what can I do with the certification? So let's talk about two different things. If you get the CEUs, those are usable towards any professional license. So those are for people who need that. If you don't need that, don't pay the additional $15. You will still get the certificate. What can you do with the certification? Well, you can put it on your wall and, and enjoy it, right? You can use it on your website. You can claim that you took this class or you could use it for a certificate. For instance, if you're serious about being an herbalist, there's um, a course of action that's called RH. That's a registered herbalist. And a registered herbalist is more widely recognized. There's no licensing of herbalists anywhere in the United States, but a registered herbalist is more widely recognized as someone who's completed a certain amount of herbal studies. And to get that, you have to show that you have about 1,600 hours of study. So this certificate from the Natural Nurse Herbal Certification course certainly can be used towards your RH, registered herbalist. And by the way, so can all the classes that you might want to take through the Florida School of Holistic Living. For instance, their family herbalist program, all the other classes that they teach here, all the herb walks that they give. Going to the conference actually gives you CEUs because the Florida School is linked into the CE broker agency, which grants Florida recognized CEUs, which are also recognized by lots of other organizations, including all the boards in all the states. You can use it that way. But if you don't need that professional and you're looking like, what can I do with this certification? You can use it towards becoming a professional herbalist in terms of being a registered herbalist. Or if you're just going to be a community herbalist and you're okay with that, by the way, just check your state. You can do that. You do need to know about language. You do need to know about signing off, having people who come to you sign something. Because what if, God forbid, they were very ill? And unfortunately, that's often who comes to professional herbalists or herbalists who are community herbalists. First, they have AIDS and cancer and they're going to die. And then the very last thing they do is decide to try something natural. So they go to an herbalist. And by the way, their family says, don't go. And they go anyway. They take one herb, you know, one, this is eyebright. So they take one a hit of eyebright and they drop dead. Well, because they were going to drop dead. Guess who gets sued? You. So you have to always be aware of that also, like, how are you preparing yourself? Like, if you're only teaching and you're not, you know, recommending, then they can't say that you did anything. But you would have to have a piece of paper, like I always do, saying, um, this person came, we had a consult, they understood my level of expertise or whatever, and I told them, you know, it's their responsibility if they take anything, etc. It's called a disclaimer. So, uh, that's something that if you have that certificate from this class, you have something showing that you did some studying, right? You didn't do 600 hours of studying. You're not a registered herbalist, but it's on that path. It's on that path because it's a lot of information that you're going to want to have before you feel comfortable enough to be like a community herbalist. So it, it's part of the education along that path. But maybe you just want to use it for yourself and your family. That's always good as well. So that was the question. What can I do with, oh, it's two new messages. Let's see. Is that drawn up with an attorney? I'm not sure what that means. Is what drawn up with an attorney? You can take your mic off, whoever sent that and ask me, or you can type more in. I don't know what you mean by is is that drawn up with an attorney? Are you meaning a disclaimer form? A disclaimer is yeah. that drawn up? With? Okay. Thank Certainly you. there are definitely attorneys who would know how to help you draw up a disclaimer form, but we actually have them um you know i've helped people do that you don't need to have an attorney to do that but it is a good idea to check into your state laws so nobody's saying that you're practicing medicine without a license in most states that's the big thing that you want to be sure that your language 
is not reflecting on that. For instance, if you were going to tell somebody to take devil's claw, let's do a little herbal quiz here, guys. Who knows what devil's claw might be good to use, it, what it might be good for? Unmute and just shout it out. Arthritis. Yes. And of course, I wrote a book also on arthritis. You can all see my books at naturalnurse.com under books. Yes, Devil's Claw is very interesting for arthritis because let's think about it. How did it get that name, Devil's Claw? That's because of the doctrine of signatures going back in time to the shamanic healers. The seed pod of that plant looks like this looks like an arthritic hand. So that's why they thought it might be good for that. And actually it is quite useful. But if someone comes to you and you give, give them devil's claw, you have to have a sheet that says, you're just recommending that they may want to try devil's claw, but make sure it says not for any reason. I don't know why. In other words, you can't say this for arthritis, because that is considered in a lot of cases, which by the way, I have been at many of these cases as a witness, as a professional nurse herbalist. So if you make it seem that you're giving it to them for a specific disease, then you could be um, really brought up on charges of practicing medicine without a license. So it's that kind of thing. So you have them sign something saying, we're going to talk about like the history, the traditional use of various herbs and, you know, how you might find them useful for yourself, not how you might find them useful for your name of disease. So those are some of the, the tricks of protection, protecting yourself. It's very sad, but unfortunately, many people who haven't done that, you know, find out it wasn't really a good idea. So you want to avoid that. So you could use an attorney or uh, even the American Herbalist Guild. We have forms on there about how to say a disclaimer, different things like that. Okay, well, ready for the next question. Somebody can unmute or we can just see if there's any more that come into the chat box. Okay, if not, I'm going to bring up one of our handouts. I, why I wanted to send you handouts even for tonight's just little gathering and get together. And I'd really like to hear a lot more from you guys with your questions, because that's what this is about. But I sent the two handouts because that's how this course runs. Um, there's four classes. The dates you can look at the Florida School to see. They're once a month on a Sunday. And if you don't attend live, it doesn't matter because as soon as it's over, we post it not on the YouTube channel, but in a special portal that you will have access to just by registering for the class. So we put both me talking just like this, the little video of it and all the handouts. I don't just use this. I also send you the handouts that you can download them yourself, just like I did today, because I wanted you to see the process. You get to keep those forever, and then you have them to download, to link from, to work on, you know, to use for information in any way that you'd like. In addition to me going through it and going, okay, slide one, and it's about this, you can check back on that. There is homework each week. Um, there's actually quite a bit of homework because that's, you can't learn in four hours enough to, you know, be considered an herbalist in any way. But when you go through all the homework, that's when you get your cert certification of completion. So she's saying, I want to sell herbal goods online. What do I need to do? Okay, that's a good question. I'll tell you this. Um, when you say herbal goods, what does that mean? If you mean reselling like this, this is from a company, it happens to be Nature's Answer. It's all labeled correctly. It's made in a GMP factory. Can you sell this and many other brands online? Is that what you're talking about? Or are you talking about making your own things at your house and then sell them online? That's what I'd need to know to even answer that question. So I will say, if it's the latter, 
do not do that until you take another class that we offer through the Florida School, and they do have it on the archives, and I also teach it privately, which is Herbal Manufacturing Legal Considerations. Okay, Herbal Manufacturing Legal Considerations, because there's a huge amount of knowledge that, you, that I need to know before I can answer this question. But I will tell you that is the biggest way that people are getting, you know, really harassed, uh, find FDA and FTC come into your house. They're also throwing everyone off Etsy. Now, if you want to make little things yourself, herbal goods, and you want to sell them at your local farmer's market where you hand it to a person, even though that's not necessarily legal, I have not ever seen anyone harassed for that. But the minute you have it, to where you it's online and they can read about it and you are mailing it before you know it they're knocking on your door and you better have a gmp facility set up and that's true for cosmetic things like soaps and lotions or lip glosses or anything so that's just a whole other topic than than what we're talking about tonight because it's huge, but I would say it's a big gift to not do it until you look into that to see if that's something you want to, you know, do. Oh, <laughs> yay, Maggie, she put a link to it right here, that class. It's called Herbal Manufacturing Legal Considerations, Know Before You Go. So that's an important aspect of it. So now we have a Yoni streaming, streaming business. Um, so are you talking about where you actually have a facility that people come into and then, you know, there's hot steam that comes up? Is that what you're talking yeah. about? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the yoning steaming is right. done with a small tub. Right. I've seen that. That you'd have to, you know, we would have to do that privately and de um, dig in because there's so many ramifications about that in terms of public health, things like that, but there are requirements and you can meet them. You know, that's just like a swimming pool or, you know, they have places that you're going in um, sort of hot tubs and all those kinds of things. So there's a lot of regulations from the Department of Health, et cetera. So whether it's legal or not, I would say, yes, it's legal, but long list of things that you have to meet in terms of the plumbing and the cleaning and this kind of thing. And the best place to start there would be ask people that you know are doing it already. Of course, a lot of times people do decide to do first and wait till they get hit up and they'll deal with it then. I'm not saying not to do that. That's one way to choose to do business. I wouldn't choose to do it that way. But you certainly could ask the people who are doing it what kind of uh, Paperwork did you have to do with the state? Did you have to get a plumbers to set this up? You know, all kinds of questions. Just like a massage therapist has certain legal requirements to set that up. So here it says there are just aren't many BCs. It's not our culture. Okay, that doesn't look like a question, but anyway. <laughs> Yes, there's a lot of different things. There's a lot of different businesses that business requirements. Yes. Um, I was just wondering, will question and answer be part of the classes, the monthly classes? Yes, always. We usually hold that towards the end. The classes are an hour and a half. They're from 930 in the morning um, until about 11. And then I try to finish up to have time on, by 11, but I also stay on there to answer questions. That's why if, if people come in later, they get all this stuff and then they can stay for the questions rather than have interruption with things that they're not focused on. So that's how we do it. We do have a question and answer in every session. Okay, thank you. So I'm gonna bring up then, um, the hand, one of the handouts that I sent you, just so you know you have this. So let's see if you can see that. Can you guys see that now? 
Yes. Okay. So you have this and you can go through it on your own, but I'll just tell you it's about the course, right? So this is the Natural Nurse Intro to Herbal Certification course, which is what we're doing. Here are the dates. It'll be Sunday, March 10th, April 14th, May 19th, June 9th, and you can look them up online on the Florida School as well. Here's all different ways to get in touch with me. You know, Facebook, Natural Nurse, Dot com naturalnurse.com has most most information and uh, etc so also we have several podcasts which have many thousands of free listening adventures on there so one of my podcasts is called herbally yours and you can find it at this link anytime and another one is called the natural nurse and dr z they have been on as radio shows since 1987 and they're also radio shows done in real students studios and you can get in in your car and you can get it in your house in the kitchen on your radio which no one has anymore so they're also all podcasts and this is just something a little bit about me because i do wild crafting i go out and gather plants as well as various kinds of teachings that i've gone through. I even mentioned here, somebody asked about Caribbean herbs. It has been my honor to have studied with indigenous and master herbalists such as Jamba of the Maroons in Jamaica, who's a maroon medicine man, Michael Moore and Mimi Kemp in Bisbee, Arizona, Sonia in Santa Cruz, Mexico, who I studied with for two years and lived in a little grass shack in the jungle with her, and Dr. Bernard Jensen, and many other people who have been really wonderful herbalists for many, many years. So you can read that, you know, on your own. I've written many, many books. And we also take people on a trip to Jamaica every year through Echo Tours for Cures. That is now actually a certified course with Bastyr University. If any of you have ever heard of Bastyr, they have a very good program in naturopathic medicine. And through that, you get class, it's actual class, and we take people to Jamaica to study with the Maroon elders. So those are just some of the adventures that we have. But now for this class, it's 18 CEUs for anyone with a license. It can also be used as um, part of your study for a registered herbalist. And that's true about every course. Like even if you take another teacher's courses, none of them, you take it and then you're an, a, you're an RH. None of them. Sometimes on the American Herbalist Guild website, when you read some of the classes, they seem to intimate that once you take this, you're an RH, but that's not the case. You still have to apply to be an RH, but you might have everything that you need pretty much, such as anatomy and physiology, botany, etc. So those are all part of it. And I do a lot of mentoring of individuals. So if you can't miss a class, don't worry about it because you can make up the class anytime on the archive. I think it's there for at least a year, maybe even longer. And then there's a lot of assignments. All of the assignments can be handed in as emails except one. There is the Capstone Herbal Preparation Project which you have to snail mail to the instructor, which is me. And that's going to involve smelling an herb. Some people grow an herb for the whole four months and then they make something out of it. You don't have to. You know, it can be very simple, very ornate. What I want to know there is because I have taught so many herbalists, but who are also professionals, and all they've ever learned to do is use, you know, pills in a bottle that happen to be herbs. They've never communicated with the plant. They've never talked to the plant. They've never known about the plant consciousness, which by the way, we do a whole section on our last class. So in order to pass this course, you have to have an intimate and personal relationship with plants. Talk to them, smell them, make things out of them, use them at least once in order to make this capstone herbal preparation project. So that has to be actually snail mail to me at the end. But everything else we can do by email. So that's why it doesn't matter if it's just amazing that we can do this now, right? Um, so this is what it's going to be about, the different classes. First, the first class is going to be 
a basics of herbal medicine, really talking about vocabulary. By the end, do you know, maybe each of you can ask yourself if you know this, do you know the difference between an extract and a tincture? Or do you think any little bottle like this is called an extract or called a tincture? A lot of confusion. And we will talk about that very specifically according to the exact language that needs to be used. What's an infusion or a decoction? What does standardized mean? People throw that word around. Oh, it's a standardized herb. What does that mean? These are the kinds of things we talk about in the basics so that we have the same language. By the time we get out of this class, we can have a conversation amongst ourselves like herb talk, you know, herbalist talk, because it's very, very specific. And unfortunately, many people who even call themselves herbalists do not understand the actual basics of the language of herbalism. So by the way, any of these classes can be taken just by itself. And then you can get three CEUs if you need them or none, if you're just interested in the information. So each of these are available just as a by itself kind of class or as part of the course. So that's class number one, it's kind of the basics. The second class is botany and botanical nomenclature. By the way, to become an RH, a registered herbalist, you do have to take at least one class in botany so that you understand Latin names, and also the, we'll talk about the doctrine of signatures, plant families, edible, medicinal, and poisonous plants, which is a good thing to look into before you go out wildcrafting. And um, this can be taken also as a standalone class. So this, this actually is a good beginner's botany class and can be used for towards your RH, if that's something that you're working on. And also to be used as an herbalist, so you have a background about what are we talking about here? What are plant families? What is a, a compound leaf? What to look for in a lot of the poisonous plants? Then the third class is called Using Herbs for Yourself and Your Family. Here's where we learn how to develop a protocol. Let's say somebody has a cold or flu, an upset stomach, other kinds of mild health issues. I'm not talking about something that you're going to really pass away from. This is like herbal first aid, but not just first aid for cuts and scratches, for common ailments that you really can self deal with, with yourself and your family. So how do you put a protocol together? There's so much on the internet. Some of it is excellent. Some of it is dangerous. Some of it is pure wrong and garbage. So we point you into, and then you actually have to create a protocol. And that's one of your homework assignments. And you tell me the energetics of those herbs. How will you find out that? Of course, I'll show you. So this is all about like a basic course on how to use herbs for yourself and your family. This can be taken as a standalone class all by itself, or you can use it as part of the class. Then the last class, the fourth one is called feeling the consciousness of plants, because I bet everybody who's in this class today right now actually has communicated with plants because I've never met someone who's really seriously an herbalist who doesn't really out and out talk to plants or kind of think they do. So either way is fine, but we're going to talk about the reality of that situation because since ancient times, people have experienced very direct communication, but now we're validating this reality with scientific investigation. So we'll investigate both the, you know, groovy feeling like you're communicating with plants and what that's about, but also the reality, the scientific stuff where we know exactly how we do it. And we'll also talk about dowsing techniques and also herb drug interactions, which is a very important thing to consider. So any of the classes can be taken by themselves or they can be taken as uh, together. So I'll stop the sharing of that one. And we'll go back to uh, taking any other questions that you have. And then we'll go into a little bit of information on the doctrine of signatures, just like we would do a class when we're all together. 
So does any, if anyone else wants to have a question, you can just, you know, hop on board and unmute yourself and ask or put it in the, in the chat if you'd like. I see something that says one new message. So let me look at that. Oh, that just says sounds great. Yeah, it is great to me. It's the most fun thing in the world as I imagine you could tell. I just love herbs. I love herbal medicine. I love talking to plants. Some of them are my best friends, but I also think as a real, in a scientific way, that botanical medicine should be a much more important part of our overall healthcare system. And then, you know, when you think about this, what about the fact that a lot of plants get actually used up? And it's wonderful that there are organizations um, such at uh, different organizations that are really focused on saving our plants. So I know the Florida School is actually involved with that as well. And that's very important. And that's one of the reasons that we talk about energy medicine, such as homeopathy and gemstone medicine, which we also touch on in the class, because you might have a very medicinal plant and you can actually make essence remedies from it that last much longer and spread out the use of the actual physical plant material. So that's, you know, that's actually another way to go so that we don't use up all our plants and also learning which plants are endangered so that we can usually always use a different species and which plants that are growing right outside our door can we learn to use for food and medicine. So all of those things are part of what we will investigate. So I don't see any other questions. Oh, she's saying, after this series, do you offer more classes or do I tr transition to the school? Well, that's up to you. I personally teach every single day. And most of the classes that I teach are not group classes. They're one-on-one. -on -one. So you decide something that you really want to learn. And then we go very deep. I have some students that have been with me like actually 35 years. It's ridiculous. But there's always more to learn. And then on my website at naturalnurse.com under events, you will see a lot of classes that I teach. I'm teaching one for NYU School of Nursing in a couple of weeks that has one CEU, but you can take it because it's just a free online class and it's gonna be about Hildegard, um, who is a nun and an herbalist. And here I'm teaching about it at NYU and it's a free class that anybody can take. So I offer a lot, a lot, a lot of classes. And in terms of taking what the school offers in terms of the Florida School of Holistic Living, they have wonderful classes that you can take at the same time or at other times. The Family Herbalist Program really gives you a very great basis of using herbs in your family, in your community, setting up herbal caring banks for when there's an emergency, all kinds of places to go with that too. So I don't think there's ever an end. I mean, let's put it this way. I've been studying this every day all day since 1964, and I don't see any end. You know, every day it's like, wow, you're kidding. You learn something new, a different perspective or a new plant or something else. So you can keep studying after this class. This is, is being offered, you know, it's a very low rate and it's a really good basis of starting out either as an herbalist, as a profession, or if you have a profession, adding herbalism in, as part of what you use in your therapeutic modalities or for yourself and your family or just self-knowledge. So for all of those things, it's, it's a good starting place. Is there an herb that you would recommend daily? Okay, well, I'll name a couple. First of all, those would be called herbs that are called adaptogens rather than herbs that are very specific for a particular healing, like healing a thing, but an adaptogen really is wonderful for your overall health. It, it affects many different things. So I'll name two. And by the way, I would never use any herb all the time, daily, all the time, but I would use it in what's called a pulsed manner and ongoingly something like 
take it six days a week for six weeks. So one that I would recommend that people use to do that with is rhodiola. That's R-H-O-D-I-O-L-A, rhodiola. And another one used to be called Siberian ginseng, but it's actually illegal to call anything Siberian ginseng for political reasons, which I'm not going to go into. So it is now called Eleuthero root. The plant is Eleuthero centicosis. That used to be called Siberian ginseng. So both rhodiola and Eleuthero are adaptogenic herbs that can be taken long term. And when I say long term, I like to do six days a week for six weeks and then maybe switch to the other one or another adaptogen like that. So those are the kind of herbs that you might want to use daily. And then like my eyebright, I happen to be holding it up here. I actually use this daily because I use it in the early morning. I put it in warm water and I use an eye wash cup and I use it not every single day, but maybe four days a week or so. So on an ongoing level. So yes, some, some herbs can be used that way. So now, before we get to the end, why don't we go through this other class that we have. So you can see how we might, oh, something about red clover. Red clover is not something I would definitely use every day because red clover has a lot of estrogenic properties to it. And so drinking it every day may be a good idea and maybe won't be a good idea. That would depend on the person themselves. So red clover is not one that is necessarily recognized as an adaptogen. However, there might be the individual where using it ongoingly would be a good idea, but it's not one of those overall adaptogens. So let's go to, to this other thing. I think I still have it here which is called the Doctrine of Signatures. And this I'm going to bring up so you can see it. Let's see if we can view. View as full screen, and then you'll see it pretty big. Okay, everybody should be able to see that now. And the Doctrine of Signatures, we'll just go through this, and then we'll take some questions at the end. So what is the doctrine of signatures? Again, this is a good place to find me at naturalnurse.com. So the doctrine of signatures is a word created by this gentleman, Bohm. And at 25, he had a vision in which he saw a relationship between God and man. And he published his rev uh, revelations and it was called Signaturi Rirum, the signature of all things. So that's where we're getting that name from. Now, if we look at, a, we're just going to look at just a couple plants. We can do this on and on. But hawthorn is so amazing because that's a really great herb for the heart. And you see how it looks like a little heart? So that's the whole concept here of the doctrine of signatures, that the plant is going to tell you through something about its form, it's going to tell you its function. And what's so amazing about that is that ancient healers often looked at these things and thought it would be good for the heart. And then when we look at the active constituents and do actual studies, we find out so often it is true. That's what's amazing. So Hawthorne, it's in the rose family. It's all over the U.S. Um, not here where I live in southern Florida. We don't have any, but where I live in Oyster Bay, New York, we do. And I think there may be some in more than northern areas of Florida, but we have it all over on Long Island. So the use of Hawthorne as a heart tonic is from the doctrine of signatures, which says, the plant gives you a cosmic clue about its potential. So it certainly does look like a little heart. By the first century, the Greek medicinal herbal, herbalist Dioscorides reportedly used Hawthorn as a heart tonic. And then later, it gets actually proven, which is just so amazing. So let's look at another one. This is a really fascinating one. This is, I can't move that far, but this is a pomegranate. I'm sure most of you recognize it. The pomegranate has several amazing signatures. First of all, again, this looks, not only does it look like a heart, it's actually around the same size as a heart. And if you turn it like that, that's like where the vena cava, the main vein that goes into the heart would fit. So that's one signature. And then inside, when we open up 
the pomegranate. It has little seeds that really, to me, reminds me of an ovary, very much so, like an ovary with little seeds in it, and also the yellow color on the inside of the pomegranate has that yellowish color, which is very similar to an ovary when it turns into the corpus luteum, which it does every month after the egg escapes, then a corpus luteum is formed there. And what happens there is it becomes an organ that releases different hormones, like, you know, the press, uh, progesterone, as a matter of fact. So pretty amazing that it has all these little insigni insignias like that. Lots of mythology about it. In ancient Greek, Persephone was, was tricked into eating pomegranate seeds, which sent her to spend six months a year underground, married to Hades, who, her husband. And during this time, her mother was very sad and supposedly refused to let crops grow, thus explaining seasonality. There's always so much interesting and beautiful folklore with plants. But the modern use, really, when we study pomegranates, is a powerful antioxidant, has a very strong degree of free radical scavenging effects. It can absorb O1, which is an oxygen radical, lower LDL levels, low density lipoprotein, which is called bad cholesterol. We'll go into why another time. And it shows in vitro anti cancer properties. So, very, very healing. And also, the leaves and the fruit are both good for so many things like hypertension and anti-helminic means it gets rid of worms and uh, anti-diarrheal and helps mucus discharge and then the dried flowers are actually good for many things such as hemorrhoids and dysentery and chronic diarrhea even bronchitis so it's a very very wonderful medicinal plant then it has antioxidant activities and we're just going to continue through this. You have this handout for yourself to use anytime, because this is what I always do. Those of you who have been with me in the um, many presentations we've done, we'll talk about the plant. We talk about the spiritual aspects, the history. We'll talk about the traditional use. And then we always look at the science, because look at this. This is 2017. You can find this yourself on PubMed. That's P-U-B-M-E-D. You can put in any plant in PubMed and find this amazing array of studies. And this is in a particular journal called Phytotherapy Research, and it's called the Cardioprotective Effect of Pomegranate Juice in Patients with Ischemic Heart Disease. How amazing is that? So they were looking at during the hospitalization period, blood pressure, heart rate, intensity, occurrence, et cetera. And they found that the result of this study suggests protective effects of pomegranate juice against myocardial ischemia and ripofusion injury. So a boom. That's why, as I was saying, the NIH is now saying there is enough data to where this is the proven medical system this, using natural remedies first, because they also exhibit such a great degree of safety as well as efficacy. So another one is ginkgo. And ginkgo is pretty interesting, that doctrine of signatures. This is a leaf. And, you know, it looks very much like the hemisphere of a brain. So does a pecan, by the way, yes? So, you know, we can find it in many ways. And ginkgo has many, many different active constituents. It's a very ancient tree. And we're going to just go through this quickly so that we can have time for a couple more questions. But this is an interesting chart because it looks at something about the doctrine of signatures. Like if you're looking at the texture, at the texture, if it's sharp and has thorns and prickles, then the healing property is probably something about acute pain, like because the thorns are sharp. So that would relate to some kind of sharp pain. And it's not necessarily a pain reliever, but also might be helpful with the cause of pain. So this is a really interesting chart about how you might consider what is the doctrine of signatures of different plants or a plant that you find yourself. So that you have, you have that one to look at in more depth if you'd like to. 
And we're going to um, basically come to an end soon, but we're certainly happy to take any other questions that you may have. I know some of you just came in recently, but we answered a lot of the questions. You have the handouts, but we can answer another question or two if, if people would like to ask one. If you do want to ask one, just unmute or write it in the chat. We have a new one. The doctrine of of signatures. Yeah, doctrine of signatures is really interesting. It, it's not just a class, of course, it's a concept. And you start looking at your whole world a lot differently when what symbols are showing up for me? Because who's to say that your decision about what a particular symbol is representing is any more or less efficacious than one of the ancient healers uh, from the past. So, you know, then when we get into actually recognizing it and studying it as well, it becomes even more fascinating. Ellen, Leslie here. Um, Hello. You were mentioning handouts and things. That's right, that's I... in your email. Okay, for, for this class or for the upcoming yes. class that starts in March? No, for this class, um, I, if, if I had your email, if you registered and they sent me your email in the registration for this class, then I sent everybody two handouts. Okay, okay. I, I had trouble getting on. I had to change my password. Oh, so I, okay. I literally got in like as you started the recording. Okay, so I have if, your if, email. So I will okay. send you these two handouts. Okay, thank you so much. I was a little lost, but I figured I, I would find my way. <laughs> okay, thanks for asking. Uh, thanks. Then how we do it when it's time for our real first class, which is in March, any of you who do sign up for the full course, um, then about 24 hours beforehand, I send you an email with the link the dedicated link that we'll be using like we did tonight. And also I'll send you your handouts. Sometimes it's a lot of handouts, like five or 10, you know, lots of stuff that you'll be using for a full month. Because besides the lecture, you have assignments to do. So then I'll send out another one without attachments, just going, well, I just sent it. So check in your spam box in case all the, uh, all the attachments went there for your class. Oh, so somebody's asking um, of if full registration for the class is paid for and an emergency occurs preventing a student from finishing, may they complete the cred credits later on? You know, that's handled, you know, on a one-on-one -on -one level. We actually don't prefer to give a refund for the class. And this is how long you have. If you sign up and start this March, all the assignments, if you want the certification, have to be handed in by December 24th, 2024. December 24th, 2024. Now, there are lots of students kind of like me, and I've always been this way. When I get an assignment, I finish it. When I went to college and they used to give you all the assignments that are due for the whole year, I'm done by the end of the month. That's how I like to work. And then when the due date came, eh, mail it in, it's done, no sweat. Other people, and you know who you are, um, like to wait till the last minute. And then of course, things happen like emergencies. You meant to do everything on time, but you didn't. So even though the last class is in June, I find some people keep up with it and they send all the assignments for the month before the next month. And then other people don't. And let me tell you, on the 24th of this year, my husband was saying, aren't you going to come with me to such and such Christmas party? And I was saying, no, because I just got inundated because that's the last day that you can hand in your assignments for 2023. So I have my homework cut out for me. I'll catch up with you on Christmas Day, you know, that kind of thing. But more or less, you have the choice of how you want to complete them. Um, do we discuss herb dowsing? We have a full course on dowsing. I think the dowsing, um, actually the dowsing course is 
because I'm, I'm a presenter and I'm part of the American Society of Dowsers. They give great dowsing courses, but I also teach a full dowsing course. In this class, we will talk about dowsing a little bit as part of, plan, of class four but it's not a total focus of the class, although I have taught just dowsing at the Florida Herbal Conference other years. I think it's a wonderful tool. It's a lot better than just guessing. If you learn how to douse correctly, you can really do a great protocol that will usually elicit a better response. So we'll only go into it a little bit in this class, but if you're interested in just herb dowsing, you could do your own private herb dowsing course. So it's 2.33, I mean 7.33, and um, this class was for an hour. I want to thank all of you so much for joining us and for your wonderful questions. And I'm just always so excited and happy to just share information about herbs. It's really one of my favorite things to do. And I'm glad you found us through the Florida School of Holistic Living. We have lots of great classes at naturalnurse.com. There's lots of great classes through the Florida School. And we'd love to see you at another presentation. Thank you so much for joining us this evening, everybody. Ciao.